Hello, this is Matthew Armstrong and welcome to Transformation Talk. Uh, today I've got the great pleasure of speaking with Laura Shanley. Uh, Laura is a freelance writer, she's a birth consultant, um, author and also the, the author of the book Unassisted Childbirth. And uh, uh, Laura's also, ha she had four children of her own, um, all unassisted at home. So. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you, Laura. Um, I also might say that you have a, your second book coming out on the 28th of February as well. Um, second edition, is it? Right, right. Yes, yeah, same book updated with uh, new information, new birth stories, new statistics, new insights. Okay, so, awesome, uh, awesome. Uh, and information about that will be available on my website, unassistedchildbirth.com. Yeah, great. Okay, so a, a lot of uh, a lot of people don't think about uh, childbirth as really anything to do with 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 health. You know, one one thing that we we are sharing is our health journey and what we're learning along the way with nutrition, with the the mind, with emotions and everything. Um, but a lot of people don't really think about childbirth. They think they go to they go to the hospital and they have their baby and that's it. Um, but you know, from from what I'm looking at. Uh, I think a high major majority of childbirths are uh, traumatic births that happen because um, it's it's not really done in a very natural, um, friendly sort of sort of sort of way that's uh, conducive to the the emotional well-being of the the child and the the parent. Um, so um, mm -hmm. it's it's something that that I really wanted to uh, bring up, especially now as we're really looking into it because we're going to be having. Our, our own child in July and we're really looking into unassisted childbirth because from what we've read about and what we've seen through documentaries and things like that is that it really seems like the for, for us anyway the, the 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 most the way that makes the most sense the way that makes the most sense um, and I know you, you've had four unassisted births and um, so can you maybe just give us a bit, a bit of background on how you came to take that route yourself Okay, uh, I got interested in this in, oh, must have been 1976 when I met my husband-to-be and now ex-husband, David, and he had become fascinated with um, the evolution of self-consciousness and he had been reading a, man, a book called um, The Five Ages of Man by Gerald Hurd and Hurd was impressed by Grantley Dickreed and he was interested in uh, birth trauma. And Grantley Dick Reed was a physician who lived in England and was writing in the first half of the 20th century. And he wrote a book called Childbirth Without Fear. The basic premise of the book is that childbirth should ideally give a woman a feeling of exaltation. It wasn't meant to be this horribly traumatic, painful ordeal. Uh, it, it should be the highlight of a, of a woman's life, of a couple's life but that the reason that it isn't, the primary reason that it isn't, is because women have become afraid of birth and that fear triggers the fight-flight response which essentially shuts down labor. So um, I became really fascinated by this concept because Dick Reed really explained what happens when a woman is afraid, you know, physiologically, that uh, the fear sends, uh, causes the body to produce adrenaline and it stops the body from producing oxytocin, the very hormone needed to give birth. It causes the blood and oxygen to flow away from the uterus and into the arms and legs so the frightened woman can run away from or fight the danger. So he says that the, the uterus of a frightened woman in labor is literally white. It doesn't have the fuel it needs. And so childbirth becomes extremely painful and problematic. Babies get stuck, all sorts of things can happen. Mm -hmm. So he believed if we could truly understand that birth has been beautifully designed. He did believe in a God or a larger consciousness. He felt that um, that birth was as beautifully designed as digestion, elimination, respiration, yeah. and that uh, as long as we didn't trigger the fight-flight response, blood and oxygen could gently flow to the uterus, you know, it could contract and easily get the baby out. And so that book just really had a profound effect on me. At the same time that, so actually the night that I met David, he gave me that book and I had not been interested in childbirth at all, never really been drawn to, to birth or having babies, never gave it much thought, but I just, something clicked in me and I just was fascinated. 
Uh, eventually, David and I became a couple, and we started reading other books that dealt with how the mind affects the body. We were um, specifically reading the Seth books by Jane Roberts, the concept there being you create your own reality. So we were looking into the, the power of thoughts and feelings, and um, so and that you really can create the birth that you want, the life that you want, if you examine your beliefs, eliminate limiting beliefs and believe in your own abilities that uh, you can manifest what you want. So one of the first areas of our lives that we decided to apply this to was birth. And I became pregnant in uh, December of 77 and we started thinking about, well, if we bring somebody into the birth, we are going to have to teach them everything that we've been reading about, you know, Grantley Dick Reed and physiologically what's happening in the body. And, and how we believe we create our own reality. And at that time, now those concepts are more well accepted. But back then there weren't a lot of people talking about it. And we just felt like that's a lot of work to try to get somebody to read everything that we were reading. And we felt that anybody we brought in would bring their own fears. And that uh, fear is, is contagious, basically. If you are around fearful people, it tends to rub off on you. Whereas if you're around people that have more confidence, more faith, that rubs off on you as well. Yeah. And so we just decided, um, okay, well then let's just do it ourselves. We had also been reading Spiritual Midwifery by Ina Mae Gaskin, and we found that helpful. The birth stories in there were very helpful for me, very inspiring. Now I look at them as being um, a little bit too interventionist. I, I don't really like the midwives telling women what to do or get in this okay. position or that position. But uh, so I found the birth stories inspiring and, and we just decided, okay, this is what we're going to do. And so, uh, so we did it. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, all went well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Our first baby was born and it was, uh, you know, it, it happened pretty quickly. I had, uh, we had a few friends there. We had a filmmaker there. And actually, we got everything on film up until the birth. I felt the baby coming. I didn't say anything to anybody. I was in the bathroom. I walked over to the bed. The filmmaker moved out of the way to let me through, turned off the camera. And as soon as I got to the bed, the baby literally came flying out. I was on my hands and knees. Oh. And I, I heard, I was planning on giving birth on my back because I felt like that's how babies are supposed to be born. But I heard an inner voice say very strongly, don't turn over. And I didn't turn over and the baby just came flying out and uh, David caught him in midair. Wow. So it was all very, very fast and the filmmaker was standing there with his jaw dropped and the camera off and so we didn't actually get to document it. <laughs> but, um, but it was just, um, you know, very uh, fast, easy birth and I absolutely felt when I was in labor that there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that no one should touch me. I did not want anyone checking me for dilation. You know, I felt like a wild animal and I felt like my body knew exactly what it was doing and all I had to do was step aside and let it happen. You know, that birth isn't a function of the conscious mind. It's uh, it's just like, you know, you go to sleep and you don't have to worry about all the chemicals you need to produce yeah. in order to go to sleep. You just sort of relax and it's taken care of and then you sleep and your heart keeps beating and, you know, you don't have to worry about that. And if you do, it'll probably keep you up. So so that's really the, the approach that I took was is really moving out of the way and just allowing my body to work the way it was designed. Yeah. And I suppose that really takes uh, and uh, tuning into your intuition, and uh, I suppose surrendering to preconceived ideas and uh, programs. I would say, yeah. Right, right. You know, and I've never been the most intuitive person, really. But um, but this just made sense to me. It made sense to me, just you know, in a rational, critical way. Just how Grantley Dick Reed had explained it, and just on a spiritual level, because I'd started to really have developed spiritual beliefs for the first time in my life. And it made more sense to me that rather than think that we're just a mass of chemicals that accidentally came together for no reason and that then somehow we managed to continue the race, but it's this horrible ordeal just fraught with peril. And then you look at 
the the other approach which is to believe that there is a loving intelligent consciousness behind and within all life yeah. and that that consciousness did design birth beautifully and that all we have to do is really allow it to happen and I think people don't realize how much they get in their own way mm. and you know we have to be able to stop birth if we need to that's what the fight flight response is for it overrides all over all other natural bodily functions you know if you are about to be attacked by a wild animal now is not the time to digest food so digestion shuts down when you figure the fight flight response yeah. now is not the time to give birth so birth shuts down your body thinks it's doing you a favor but now we're triggering the fight flight response you know in traffic on the way to work you know yeah. uh, or any little problem we have where where you can feel it coursing through your body you can feel that adrenaline you know when you get in a state of stress and adrenaline absolutely shuts down birth and so uh, so I think it really is much easier than most people realize if you can just truly come to accept the fact that it birth has been well designed the same consciousness that knew how to grow that baby inside of a woman it knows, you know, it knows how to grow fingers and toes. It doesn't need your input. It doesn't need you figuring out is this the week for fingers and toes or you know <laughs> internal organs to develop this much or, you know, it doesn't need your input in birth. Uh, it only needs your input if somebody is about to attack you and you need to run away. Then, then good. Trigger fight flight and shut down birth. Otherwise, relax. Trust your body. Move out of the way. Don't interfere physically or psychologically. And, and babies come out easily. Wow, that makes really perfect sense what you're saying, that really perfect sense. Um, and a lot of mothers would be, would be afraid that um, if they didn't have some sort of medical supervision there, and um, that, uh, you know, what, what happens if, if there's complications? You know, what, what do you do then? Um, um, that, that's what a, a, like one of the main fears that, that mothers would have about having an unassisted birth. You know, what, what is your maybe experience or your um, perceptions on that? Well, I think, you know, yes, it's true. If you truly have a, a life-threatening, you know, emergency, if something truly goes wrong, you don't have someone there. Um, what you have to do, though, is you have to really weigh that against if you have someone there, say a midwife, a doctor, they have rules and regulations that they are almost always required to follow. I personally believe that these rules and regulations are more dangerous than simply trusting yourself. They are visit these people are not just, yeah, we'll be here if you need us. Go ahead and let your body give birth. They're timing you, they're measuring you, they're, you know, every birth is divided into these different stages. It's just like pregnancy, people talk about, I'm in my first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, everything is compartmentalized. When it really is just, it's one smooth process. The birth doesn't have to be divided into these different phases and a number put on this and then every woman has to be 10 centimeters dilated and then once she's 10 centimeters dilated, then she has to push. Hmm. You know, there's all kinds of rules that I believe are not based on true science and they are, uh, and this is what a midwife or doctor most likely will bring to your birth. So. Yes, they may help you if a complication occurs. They very well may and often do cause the complication because even if you are calm and you're not triggering fight flight, you know, the other the other two reasons why birth can be problematic are outside intervention and poverty. You know, certainly, uh, and this is something that I, I cover in my book too, that, you know, if, of course, if you're living in poverty, you're starving to death, you know, no, you don't have clean water and adequate food. Yeah, you're going to have problems. Uh, but also, if you have the healthiest diet in the world and you surround yourself with people that are continually interfering with you, even if they, even if all they do is observe, there is a French obstetrician, Michelle Odant, who um, is very supportive of home birth and unassisted birth, and he actually wrote the foreword to the new edition of my book, and he says. Basically, a woman needs to go in, off to another planet when she gives birth. She's sort of going into this altered state of consciousness. And it's, it's pretty much like if you're making love, and he says, imagine that you're making love and the energy is flowing and everything is wonderful, and suddenly someone taps you on the shoulder and says, 
excuse me, what's your social security number? And so he said, what this is, what this does, and what happens in the hospital is that the, the doctors and the midwives are bringing you out of your intuitive, creative, artistic mind, and they're bringing you into your rational, critical thinking mind. You, you're, you're triggering, you're stimulating the neocortex, and that basically shuts off birth. It's just like interfering with sex. Somebody knocks on your door, tells you you're getting audited. You know, it's like, and it, it, the trauma that just, but even somebody just observing you, even if they say, well, I'm just gonna watch you and I'm not gonna interfere. Well, birth is a sexual act. It involves the, the same organs and hormones as sex. And how would you feel if you're having sex and someone is watching? And I'm just going to watch you. And my presence won't interfere. Well, it does interfere. And women in labor are very sensitive. So I think when you think about, you know, whether, okay, if, if something goes wrong and no one's there, but, but I've read too many stories of something going wrong because someone is there. So for me personally, I felt safer trusting my body. Uh, and rather than bringing in somebody that I felt was I was not going to be comfortable having somebody there I felt it was going to be a problem for me if someone is more comfortable having someone there then maybe that they should do that but I think then if they truly delve into that and say well why would I feel comfortable having someone there then they'll realize oh well because I'm afraid so the other thing about complications is that I think you really need to examine what is a complication because to me, so many things that are defined as complications in childbirth and are treated as complications are just normal variations that say, you know, my second baby was a footling breach. So he came out feet first, was, I, I wasn't expecting that. Now in the hospital, I never would have been allowed to get to that point. They would have cut me open before I even, you know, probably I wouldn't have even gone into labor. If I had, they would have done a C-section. Yeah. So, um, but I gave birth to him very easily. It was a two hour labor. I just moved out of the way. I caught him myself. And I just, you know, his feet started coming out. There wasn't the pressure from the head, which I felt with my first birth. Mm -hmm. um, and actually my first birth was a face presentation, which they will sometimes do a C-section for. He came out face first rather than the back of his head. So. Yeah was you know so that could also be considered a complication yet he came out easily footling breach came out easily next baby posterior she was facing my front rather than facing my back another reason uh, I someone told me today about a friend of mine oh they had to have a c-section baby was posterior I'm like oh god I had a posterior baby they didn't have to do that you know so so I think we need to re-examine what is a complication and, um, and, and I think so much of the time, if we don't panic, because if you panic when you see, oh, this is a complication, and you panic, bang, you just shut off the flow of blood and oxygen to the uterus. Then, you know, so if you're in the hospital and they say, oh, you know, your baby's in distress. We can see your baby's in distress. Well, what are they doing? Are they, did they just tell you that your baby is in the wrong position, you know, or did, something happened that caused you to panic yes then you shut off the flow of blood and oxygen to your baby and yes your baby's in distress what's the solution cut you open or help you calm down to get that blood flow again um, but I think you know the complication issue it's just something that each person has to weigh for themselves and see what they what feels comfortable to them yeah yeah it makes sense so not all supposed complications are complications and uh so why, why do you think that uh, physicians um, feel they need to intervene so much um, with, with, with births that can't just happen naturally? I think that, that most people um, just believe the myths. They don't question the myths. Certainly the medical schools are teaching that birth is inherently dangerous, that we know this because we can look throughout history and see that large numbers of mothers and babies were dying. Well, first of all, I don't, I, I, I believe that yes, probably in poor countries uh, or in poor cultures that, that there was more death because women were starving, you know, they had, life was problematic. 
Uh, but in healthy tribal cultures, this wasn't happening. I've read stories from anthropologists who could live with a tribe for years and say they never saw a death or a complication in birth, that, um, that it really is a myth. There's a woman, who, Judith Goldsmith, who wrote a book called um, Childbirth Wisdom from the World's Oldest Societies. It's out of print now. But, and, and she has just story upon story of women in tribal cultures who just did beautifully. So now if you live in a tribal culture where you were starving, yes, there were problems. If you lived in a tribal culture that had dangerous practices surrounding birth, which uh, a lot of these tribes believed in rubbing dung into the umbilical cord, separating the mother from the baby right after birth, um, that women were maybe not treated well. So there were reasons why it would sometimes be problematic. But if you had healthy, peaceful tribal cultures, the births went beautifully. I have stories in my book of women who gave birth while they were sleeping because they had such a relaxed attitude about birth. And, you know, you do hear stories of women being out in the rice fields and squatting down and catching their baby and going back to work. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think they got exercise and, um, you know, fresh air, and they didn't interfere. So I think that, that doctors overall have a belief that birth, that mothers and babies were dying prior to the advent of the modern day hospital. They firmly believe that. They believe women's bodies were poorly designed or not really designed at all because I think a lot of doctors are sort of materialists. If you talk to them about spiritual beliefs, even if they have some spiritual beliefs, say, you know, they, they may say, well, God gave us doctors. You know, I've heard people say that. Like, why don't you apply your spiritual beliefs to your birth? Because God gave us doctors. Well, why did God design births so poorly, you know, if, so to me that doesn't make sense. So I think that, that a lot of doctors don't question their beliefs. They just, they don't look at this as a belief, that the idea that childbirth is inherently dangerous and inherently painful. To them, that's a truth. It's not a belief. Mm -hmm. So they don't question it. They, I think they're afraid to, um, you know, doc, OBGYNs are, it's the most sued specialty. And, um, so the average OBGYN is sued two and a half times during his or her lifetime. So a lot of doctors are making decisions based on the fear of a lawsuit. And unfortunately, there is this idea that if you've done a C-section, you've done everything that you could. If a doctor goes to court and they say, well, this baby died because now I, in, in the United States, a baby is still born in an American hospital every 15 to 20 minutes which is about the same number of, every 15 to 20 minutes I think a baby is born at home, maybe not quite that often, but every 15 to 20 minutes a baby is still born in an American hospital. Now, if a baby is, is still born and it was a C-section, they may say, okay, the doctor did everything he could. If he didn't or she didn't do a C-section, the doctor may be blamed. And so fear of lawsuits is, is a big reason. And I've, I've read interviews, um, Jennifer Block talks about this in her book, Pushed. Uh, and she says, you know, she's interviewed doctors. Uh, well, they say, I didn't really want to do a C-section, but I don't want to get sued. And so, so I think that's another reason. I think it's just a, a lack of trust in women's bodies. I think they just believe that women's bodies were poorly designed. Some of it, you know, I think, I think some doctors or maybe most doctors are genuinely concerned and they feel that this is a horrible ordeal that a woman has to go through and they are gonna do everything they can to make this a good experience. And in their mind, a C-section is the way to go. And so, you know, maybe their, their motivations are good. There are also doctors that it, it's an ego thing. Um, you know, I heard one doctor say, the only time I really feel like I've delivered a baby is when I do a C-section. Otherwise, it's really the woman giving birth. Huh. You know, it's sort of a, it can be sort of a power thing where the doctor is in charge and the doctor's going to call the shots. The doctor's going to tell the woman what to do and what position to get in. And he or she knows best. And the mother is just this kind of moron that, you know, unskilled and uh, untrained, certainly hasn't been to medical school, couldn't possibly understand her body. So I think some of that is going on too. Right. Yeah, that, that's something I, I was uh, 
reading about uh, lately was the about that especially in the US the suing culture is doctors are afraid of being sued and that's that's a fear that they they, they bring to the table when they're they're delivering a baby and uh, so they don't want to take any chances so they f- suppose they feel they need to be in control and and doing things to to make sure that doesn't happen yeah right i think you know it, it, the same thing unfortunately can happen with a midwife to a degree because a midwife even at a home birth you know I know that probably most midwives would rather trust the woman, would rather have the woman do what she wants to do. Mm-hmm. But the midwife in, in many states it has her list of rules and regulations that she is supposed to follow. Where I live in Colorado, if uh, the water, a woman's water breaks, if within 12 hours she isn't showing significant progress, then the midwife is supposed to transfer the woman to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know I've spoken with midwives and as much as they want to let that woman give birth in her own time and in her own way, they're afraid of losing their license. They're afraid of going to jail because midwives, there are midwives across the country that have gone to jail or in jail because of uh, something happens at a birth. A a doctor might get sued, a midwife could go to jail. Mm -hmm. And so, even the most caring midwife somewhere in the back of her mind is thinking in in many cases I better you know who am I gonna listen to the state or the woman and if I listen to the woman and something goes wrong and I get blamed then I you know I had a midwife tell me uh, you know I have a family to support and I just she said I believe in what you're doing I I believe what you say is true Hmm. but she was resistant too because she said if everybody gave birth like I did she'd be out of business so she you know she wanted women to be dependent on her she wanted to have an income which of course I understand but you know there isn't a lot of money in promoting an assisted childbirth (laughs) right right um, I've, I've, I've heard that uh, the majority of hospital births are considered to be traumatic and uh, traumatic in nature. Um, what, what, are, what would be considered a tra- traumatic birth from your perspective and uh, uh, what would be the, the psychological effects on the, the, the baby and the mother and the, and the family, um, you know, not just then but then later on in life? Okay. I think when you feel like your choices have been taken away from you, that um, you know, like a, a woman says, I, I knew that if they would just leave me alone, I could. Uh, one woman described it, I, I read a birth story where she was saying, she was with her husband and I think she had a doula with her and she said, we, we kept getting into the zone. Uh, basically, you know, that zone, it's the artistic creative zone where you can just feel the energy flowing. And it's regardless of what you do in your life, if you're, if you're an artist and you're painting a picture or, or even if you work on the computer, you can feel when you kind of get into that place where everything's flowing. So she said she could feel that. And then every 15 minutes they came in to check her for dilation. And it was just like it would snap all of them out of it and she felt like she had to keep starting over and so and eventually they told her well you're not progressing and so we have to do a Mm c-section you know so certainly women feel that um, you know to have major surgery at the birth of a baby it's uh, you you know you have to spend days weeks months sometimes recovering some women do better than others but it's to be cut into as a major trauma on uh, on the body and I know of women you know when they cut into a woman um, I, I've read that at least and this number is is probably underreported uh, that that at least two percent of babies are cut into during c-sections I did a TV show in London and, and a woman who was with me who had an unassisted birth and I mentioned that statistic to her after we got off the air I said you know that at least two percent of babies are cut into during c-sections and she points to this scar on running down her face and she said what do you think that is huh. she said my, the, my mother had a c-section and they sliced into my face wow. so I was like oh why did you tell them we were on the air and <laughs> saying how horrible unassisted birth is but um, <laughs> babies can be injured during c-sections that certainly can be traumatic it's there's all kinds of benefits to the baby from going through labor 
uh, the uh, immunities are strengthened. You know, there's all sorts of immunities they get from going through the birth canal. The mucus is forced out of their lungs during the contractions. So uh, babies that are born by C-section have more breathing problems. They uh, end up in the uh, uh, neonatal intensive care unit a good amount of the time. Um, and they're certainly, you know, if they're taken early, they may not have had the chance to fully develop. A lot of development happens in the last couple weeks. Psychologically, uh, to, to be taken rather than to go through that process, I think it's, it's harmful. I think just, and even physiologically, the, the mother is producing that oxytocin, which Michelle O'Donnell says is the love hormone. Mm -hmm. It bonds the baby to the mother, it bonds the mother to the baby. And so if a baby is, is taken via C-section, the mother isn't producing th those bonding hormones. Not that the baby and the mother can't recover, because I think they do, but, um, but they do miss out on that on, or they can miss out on that ecstasy. You know, I, when I've given birth, I've felt that ecstasy. It's, you know, the highlight of, of my life. My births have been the highlights of my life. And I think some of that is just, you know, dealing with the various challenges of labor and seeing that, yes, I can trust my body. You know, it gave me a tremendous amount of confidence in myself. I was not a very confident person. And suddenly I saw, wow, I did this. And you feel this power like surging through you and learning to sort of ride those waves. It's exhilarating, it's exciting. And I, I think it's just a very needed experience, at least it was for me. And I've talked to women who said, I feel like I, I missed something, you know, that, that they didn't get to experience that, that yes, it was wonderful seeing their baby, but you know, then they, they can't move very much because they're, you know, they're, they have this, scar you know they have the stitches and then you know in the first few days there are they may be on morphine while they're breastfeeding so another problem is that babies whose mothers have have uh, are on morphine well it's going through their their breast milk so so that's another problem you know I've read about postpartum depression and that it is more common in women who have had uh, C-sections or births that were greatly interfered with that I, I talk about I use the term postpartum elation because that's how I felt there was never after any of my births any sense of depression like what kind of what what kind of sense does that make that you just had a baby and now you're morbidly depressed or you know it makes more sense to me that you should be elated and I think you can be elated uh, but when the hormones have been interfered with and when you you don't have that sense of exhilaration that can come from a natural birth. Now I know, you know, and I don't want to be a, a, a natural birth snob and say that it isn't possible to have that with a birth that has been sort of orchestrated by someone outside of the woman. I, I think birth is such a powerful experience that it can still, you can still have those feelings, but I think it's a little bit more difficult. And then as far as birth trauma, um, I do believe that if your first experience coming into the world is painful and difficult and your mother was screaming and, uh, you know, and, and birth wasn't really allowed to flow the way that it's meant to and, the, and maybe, you know, you got stuck in the birth canal or whatever, I think that sets the tone for future experiences. I think that you, you sort of approach life with uh, in, a, in a timid way and um, and so I think that on, on a deeper level that it does affect us and here again I think we can overcome that but if you were born in ecstasy what are that seems to me like a better way to be born that I tell my children their births were the greatest experiences of my life and they've known that their whole life how much their births changed me and and um, and when you weigh that against someone who's told her children, you know, I was in labor with you for 20 hours, and you know, it does, it can cause guilt, and certainly it can cause guilt towards the husband, I know, or the partner. Uh, I know many men who say, I don't, you know, I don't want to put my wife through that, or, you know, you always see things on TV or in the movies where the woman is like hitting the man and saying, you did this, and you know, you're never touching me again, like, you know, where I was, I was just like 
so thankful to my husband for for teaching me about this and for supporting me through this and um, and so you know so I think the, the the effects of a good birth are are really long lasting. Yeah, yeah, I I, uh, I, I definitely would have had that uh, view before. I've really had my eyes opened um, since since uh, myself and Victoria have started reading um, books and watching documentaries um, because I would have had that view before I basically basically programmed from what I have seen on TV about how birth is and uh, and then just hearing some people's experiences and and you know including my my own mother's about hospital births with my my sister she was tied down with my sister having oh, wow. yeah, yeah so uh, so that would have been my view beforehand so it, it's been phenomenal just a real eye-opener um how um how how can the mother's beliefs um, affect the experience of childbirth, and uh, then how can they they start to maybe change those beliefs if those beliefs aren't uh, uh, conducive to a, 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 a good a good birth? I think first of all, just pay attention to uh, your day to day thoughts and feelings, and you know if a woman starts to imagine giving birth, how does she feel? Does she feel, does a sense of peace come over her or does she start to feel a tightness in her chest? Does she have a funny feeling in her stomach? Um, that's a sign that adrenaline has been triggered. You know, you can feel when the fight flight re uh, response has been turned on. And so if you start to think about the birth and you envision the birth and you start becoming aware of these sensations in your body, that will tell you that, uh, that you have some beliefs that that you need to face and change, you know, and explore a little further. Why do you? Why are you afraid? Dig a little deeper. Um, so, pay attention to your conversations you're having with other people. Uh, I think some women, even women in the natural birth community, will say, you know, birth is the hardest thing a woman will ever go through, or the pain. A birth has to be painful. It serves a purpose. I've heard people say this. If you don't have the pain, you can't have the pleasure. These, to me, are all beliefs. They're not truths. And I think we have to just be willing to at least entertain that concept that there are truths and there are beliefs, mm -hmm. and and that these are not truths. That um, that these are beliefs that can be um, acknowledged and changed. Uh, I also paid attention to my dreams. What was I dreaming? In the beginning of my pregnancy, I dreamt I was surrounded by my father, who was a physician, mm -hmm. and other doctors. And I was in a hospital, and I was in pain, and it was a difficult birth. By the end of my pregnancy, I was dreaming I was giving birth at home, and it was very easy and, and simple and pleasurable. Mm -hmm. So what I did is um, I just sort of honestly looked at what is it that I believe. Now, I most of my fear of birth was removed by reading childbirth without fear it's just i it i just took right to it it just made absolute sense to me um uh, because i was reading the books about you create your own reality that concept made sense to me i had already had some experience with seeing things that i had wanted to come into my life i felt they were coming into my life so i was starting to gain confidence in my ability to bring into my life what i wanted um, and so I just sort of started, you know, becoming aware. Some people, if you're into journaling, that can be a good way to sort of find out what it is you believe about birth. If you, I've heard women say, well, I'm not afraid of birth, but I want a midwife there. Well, why? And, you know, I did a radio interview once and this woman was telling me, well, I, the host was telling me, I had no fear of birth. I was totally confident in my body. I, and I went into the hospital and I ended up with a C-section. Now tell me why that happened when I certainly believed in myself. And I said, well, why did you give birth in a hospital if you were so confident? And not to be critical of women who give birth in hospitals, but I just asked her that question, and she was like, "Well, I was a, f well, I was," a a and she just, you know, stuttered over her words because she didn't want to say, "Well, because I was afraid that something was going to go wrong," and so I think it's okay to admit you're afraid, you know, and it's okay if I, 
in birth, I do really well. I have other areas of my life where I struggle, but I try to apply these same concepts to all areas of my life. I think I've been the most success successful with birth, but I think we just have to honestly admit, if you're afraid, okay, then just say you're afraid, and then take steps to change that. For me, it's education, reading about why birth can sometimes be problematic, and as I've said, to me, it can generally be traced to poverty, unnecessary medical intervention, and fear, and other emotions. Um, so, you know, do a little bit of reading, and that will help alleviate your fears. And then, for me, I'm a big believer in belief suggestions or affirmations, mm -hmm. so, uh, and also in visualization. So I created some belief suggestions that I said during my pregnancy. I believe I'm not afraid. I believe, I also worked on shame and guilt that if you are ashamed of your sexuality, if you think that, that sex is dirty, uh, then you know birth can be, if sex is, is a sin, then birth can be the punishment. You know, so, um, so I really told myself that I loved and accepted my sexuality. I loved and accepted my body. I worked on forgiveness. I think forgiveness can get in the way if you are angry, uh, if you're angry at yourself, if you're angry at other people, if you're angry about your last birth and you feel like everybody interfered with it and had nothing to do with you, they made it a bad birth. I think accept responsibility. Yes, they they may have done things to you, but you consented. You know, so you forgive yourself, accept responsibility, but um, you know, forgive yourself, forgive everyone around you for anything and everything. So yeah, so I'm a. I also believe in visualization. Um, that you know imagine what it the kind of birth that you want and uh, and then trust that your body is paying attention to what you're thinking you know imagination is very powerful so I think we have all sorts of natural resources we can tap into and um, you know as I said I worked with my dreams so and, and I didn't um, you know if, if women are into prayer then certainly you can pray so um, you know tap into that uh, that knowledge within you and tap into that strength within you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely agree that uh, beliefs are key and uh, they can they can make all the difference. Quite often, the the, the major key for sure. Um, are, are there are there any times when you wouldn't recommend a mother to have a um, a, a natural unassisted birth? Any occasions? There's nothing that really comes to mind. I mean, I've known women who have, um, you know, I knew a woman who lived in my town who had uh, sort of epileptic epileptic seizures periodically, and um, uh, you know, she was she went to a doctor and she was told that she would be considered high risk, and so she would be given a C-section, mm -hmm. and. Um, she felt that subjecting her body to a c-section would be more dangerous and she really wanted to give birth unassisted and she did and she had a great birth I, I have a story on my website from a woman who had some sort of seizure and she actually wasn't planning on giving birth unassisted but she had a seizure and woke up to discover she had given birth to twins wow. so <laughs> and the twins they were okay initially they thought that one of them wasn't alive but it, they went to the hospital on the way the baby just kind of woke up and then was fine um, so I'm you know I'm always cautious like when people write to me all the time and then do you think I should have an unassisted birth I, I have never told anyone I think they should and I've never told anyone I think they shouldn't I just I really encourage people to sort of tune into themselves and to do their own research and do what makes them feel comfortable I don't feel like I know enough, certainly when someone writes to me and you know I don't know enough and even if I knew them you know in person and my day-to-day -day, I still don't feel like I am qualified to decide I feel like ultimately they they have to you know do the research themselves and if they do have something that would classify them as high risk I think the high risk box has gotten bigger and bigger over the years 
and what is normal birth, that box has gotten smaller and smaller and it's harder for women to fit into that box. Oh, you have such and such of a condition, well now you're considered high risk. And so now we're gonna give you a C-section. Even though that, you know, I know a woman who had a, like a broken ankle, well, okay, C-section. It's like, what does that have to do with anything you now? Right. So, so I think, you know, I really can't think of anything. I know some people say obesity is, um, you know, can complicate a birth, but I know women who have been obese or women, I know a woman that only gained 10 pounds. She was very thin and she gained 10 pounds during her pregnancy and she had a six pound baby unassisted. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've known women, you know, I knew a woman that bled throughout her labor that did fine. Um, a woman, you know, women whose water breaks and then they give birth four days later, five days later, whereas in the hospital, you know, they just won't allow that to happen. Oh, your water breaks, oh, you have to give birth now. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, there, and certainly the different positions, like I said, Footling Breach, that was probably my easiest birth or, you know, one of my easiest births. So my last baby was born, uh, my husband was down the hall, I hadn't even told him I was in labor yet, and I went to take a bath and she slid into my hands hmm. before I even said, hey, I'm in labor. You know, so, but I could just feel, I was, I stepped aside and I just let it happen. I didn't even realize she was there until I felt her starting to come out. Hmm. So, and I'm not, I don't look at myself as being unusual. There's nothing different about me. Um, I didn't, you know, I talked to a yoga teacher once who said that she had beautiful births, so, you know, wonderful and easy and, and you know, almost no pain. And, uh, and she taught classes. I said, well, do you tell all your students about that? And she's like, oh, no, it was my years of yoga training that enabled me to have a birth like that. And I wouldn't think, you know, I wouldn't want my students to think that they could do that because, you know, I had done all these things, exceptional things. Well, I am like your average person. And, you know, I didn't follow any particular diet. Uh, I've had people get on my case about that, write to me about that. Uh, I, morning sickness, you know, people assume that, oh, you, you know, that's what happens when you're pregnant. I've heard people say, oh, that's even a good sign. It shows that, you know, the hormones are really surging through your system and everything, the pregnancy is really taking. And I'm like, well, I don't believe that. I believe that it's, uh, it's a fear reaction and that uh, why should the hormones, you know, the hormones can, they know what they're doing, you know, they don't have to wreak havoc on your body. So um, I started throwing up one day with my first pregnancy and I just said, I asked myself, what am I afraid of? Because I didn't feel like I was afraid of the birth and what came to me was that I was afraid of motherhood and I told myself, okay, I trust I'm going to be a good mother, I'll know what to do. And I never threw up again for the rest of that pregnancy and I never threw up in any of my other pregnancies. So I question everything that people say is a normal part of birth and I just think okay, I, I, you know, my mother had morning sickness, both my sisters had morning sickness, I don't look at it as it's just, well it's just I've got good genes, you know. Uh, I look at it as that I recognize that the, the idea that you need to have morning sickness during pregnancy is a belief. I recognized it as a belief and something that I could change. Mm -hmm. And I did. Very, very powerful, very powerful. And uh, you know, from what I get, I'm getting as well is it's, uh, it's a lot about taking, taking responsibility as, as well. Um, and I suppose part of the fear that maybe many people experience is the, the the fear of taking responsibility themselves and then something um, not going right and then blaming themselves but if they hand <laughs> the responsibility over to the doctors then you know they've done everything they could and then maybe it's the the, the, the doctor's fault or whatever you know so uh, yeah, yeah it, it's like a different level of consciousness it's uh, maybe moving from a place of like a blame consciousness to a place of taking responsibility and uh, I, I guess that's part of it Right. And I think, you know, I've talked to women who, um, and certainly, you know, babies do die at home, and I'm not going to say that they don't die at home. Yeah. Um, but uh, if a baby dies in the hospital, and even if the woman can say, well, okay, but, you know, the doctor did such and such, 
does it does it really make the woman feel any better and there are also many women that will say I had a, a letter from a woman and she said that uh, they she didn't feel that there was any rush but the doctor felt that he wanted the baby out now and he went in with forceps and he compressed the baby's umbilical cord and the baby died mm -hmm. and she said I can't help but feel that maybe he would have survived had he been born at home so I think if if you have a baby that dies in the hospital and I'm not necessarily there are babies that die it's nobody's fault um, you know one in five pregnancies I think ends in miscarriage and and babies die regardless of where they're born it's just that that happens but I think if women think well if I give birth in the hospital and the baby dies then at least I won't blame myself they have to consider the fact that they may what if the doctor did do something like compress the umbilical cord then aren't they still going to have that sense of guilt you know not that they should I, I don't believe that women should punish themselves or have you know feel guilty if something goes wrong I think we need to forgive ourselves and but um, you know you really can't free yourself from that ultimately you have to accept responsibility for uh, you know for your life and for your births and I think the baby also has a role I you know people think well, the baby has if a baby dies well you know I personally believe maybe that baby only wanted to experience life in the womb you know I don't I believe that that there's much more here than meets the eye and that we before we come into this world that we have made the decision to come here and you know so I, I do believe that babies some babies just don't choose to have a physical existence and that's just the way it is um, and that is um, a higher understanding for sure, for sure. Um, what, what about a few specific uh, complications like uh, like cord around the neck, like uh, uh, or even even the um, I, I know if the the baby on the due date if it goes past two weeks then that's considered um, an issue that has to be handled by the medical establishment or. Um, birthing the placenta those are maybe a few things could would you be able to cover the, the delayed birthing of the pl placenta um, could you cover uh, that? I got an email from uh, from a couple in Spain a few years ago and they've given birth they put out a, a really beautiful video of uh, where she gave birth outside the woman gave birth outside and it was really lovely and it was an unassisted birth and then a few years later they had another unassisted birth and uh, they sent me a letter, you know, we, uh, you know, our baby was born, and, you know, beautiful birth, and three days later, uh, the mama birthed the placenta and we buried it under a tree. Well, you don't really hear that very often, three days later, you know, and I asked them, but yeah, it's like, okay, it took a while. But I, but I do hear from people who, uh, and especially in an unassisted or a home birth where no one is there saying, this placenta has to come out now. Uh, where it can take six or seven hours. It doesn't necessarily have to be a complication. Yeah. And I think here again, it gets back to relaxation and that, um, you know, if you are truly relaxed, I, I personally believe if, if you're really relaxed, the placenta should come out pretty easily and pretty quickly afterwards. But if it doesn't, I would just work more on the mental side of things and certainly don't pull on the umbilical cord. I think it, it all gets back to, um, you know, Sarah Buckley, who is a, a physician who is very supportive of home birth. And uh, she and her husband were both physicians, but they had unassisted births because they didn't treat them as they didn't act as doctors during their births but she's she writes a lot about birth and she says that um, fourth stage of labor the delivery of the placenta is labor and I think women think oh baby's out okay and then they you know everybody comes in the room and everybody's celebrating and it, it kind of brings not that you shouldn't be happy and all that but then if especially in in the hospital if they start fooling with the woman or you know doing their various interventions no you need to remain in that sort of altered state and um, one another thing that fight flight does is it shuts down or greatly reduces the flow of estrogen and if you don't have estrogen the cervix the cervix doesn't soften which means that the baby can get stuck and not come out in the first place or the cervix doesn't close and so you can hemorrhage you know so so here again it gets back to fight flight and not panicking and 
and um, having a more relaxed attitude about the delivery of the placenta. It isn't a, another flawed aspect of birth. It's just, you just need to be patient. And, and so much of the time in the hospital, they're right in there pulling and you know pressing on a woman's belly. And I've even known midwives who've been pressing on the belly. I knew a woman in my town who was planning a midwife assisted birth, but she gave birth before the midwife got there beautiful birth well the midwife gets there 15 minutes after the birth and she said according to Colorado law we got to get this placenta out within an hour wow. so you know so the midwife started pulling on the cord and she reached up inside the woman and actually pulled out half the placenta tore it in half hmm. and the woman ended up having a hemorrhage and and spending four days in the hospital so this is not a typical midwife assisted birth but um, you know, it is something that that midwives and doctors, many of them, believe that the placenta has to come out immediately. So, so that's one thing that that I think we just need to have a more relaxed attitude about it. Not put those, um, you know, say that it has to it has to happen in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Just relax and allow it to come out, and it'll come out. Yeah. And what were the other things? Oh, cord around the neck. Yeah. Um, I have read that about 25% of babies are born with the cord around their neck. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be an emergency. The blood and oxygen are going through the cord. So it's not like the baby is breathing, you know, using its lungs in the womb. Mm -hmm. And so now you don't really want the cord to be tight around the neck, but you know, a lot of cords are wrapped around the neck or other body parts. My last baby came out and I looked down and I saw the cord was around her neck and I just unwound it and she was fine. So I, I got a letter from a woman who said she'd had six home births. All six had the cord wrapped around the neck. Two of them, it was wrapped around twice and one it was wrapped around three times. And she said they just un unwound it. So, but it's another one of these things that people panic about. Oh my God, what if the cord's around the neck? Well, just unwind it. You know, there are times, I suppose, if it's really tight or that it that it could be problematic. And I've heard of, of sometimes midwives cutting the cord before the baby comes out. I don't know, but the blood and oxygen is still going through the cord. And so that's why I believe in waiting after the baby comes out. I think it's good to wait until the cord stops pulsating before you cut it because the baby is getting all that wonderful blood and oxygen when you have people banking their bla their baby's blood because cord blood is so good and it's so valuable. Yes, they're right. Let the baby have it. Don't cut the cord and then save that blood because someday they might need it. They, they need it now. You know, that's a good amount of blood that's going through there. So, yeah. so wait. Yeah. And yeah, that's great. And um, if what about if the baby isn't born, was it two weeks after the due okay. date? Uh, you know, I think this this forty week thing. You know, they like nice round figures like that. You know, it's just like the every everybody has to be ten centimeters before they can push, and then once they're ten centimeters, they have to push. Every baby has to be born at forty weeks. You know, no later than forty weeks. And and I get stories all the time from women who go forty two weeks, forty three weeks, even sometimes forty four weeks, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, some babies take longer than others. Now, I do think that that if you are really terrified of birth, you can delay a birth, and I've seen that happen. Where women, I think women can keep themselves from going into labor, and so um, you know, and so, and if that's true, and you're keeping a baby in who really needs to be born, you know, that that might be a problem. But generally, then I think if you're able to truly relax and a baby allow the baby to come out. That in, in most cases, the, the women that I hear from, the babies are fine when they're born past 40 weeks. Now, on the other hand, if they're born 38 weeks, 37 weeks, even 39 weeks, that can sometimes be problematic that they're not fully developed. But some babies may be ready to be born before 40 weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, some, some mothers get to the point where they say, I need, I need medication, I need this, this pain is too much, or... Um, is there a way to prepare for that or to not have that pain or to deal with it some other way? Well, I, you know, for me, I felt, I believed what Grantley Dickreed said, that if you can allow the blood and oxygen to flow to the uterus, that it really, you shouldn't experience much pain. And, and I felt that way. Now, with my third baby, 
who was uh, posterior, you know, turned towards my front mm-hmm. um, rather than my back. I had more pain with that labor. But I took a shower. I said my belief suggestions. Um, I, I never felt like I wanted to go to the hospital. I think, I think so much of the time that that it's not just pain that women that causes women to go to the hospital. It's fear. Mm-hmm. It's the and I'll, and I've heard women who say that you know I was in so much pain. I went to the hospital, but then baby was born right away. Like because suddenly they were able to relax because they still. They realized they still had some fear. Yep. So, um, so I think if you can eliminate that fear, you have a much better chance of giving birth with very little pain. And some women don't have pain. Some women experience pleasure. I think if you do have pain, then you know, love yourself, forgive yourself, believe in yourself. Still try to let your body work. And if you really feel like you know, I just want to go to the hospital then go, you know, it's not the end of the world. I'm not saying that all hospital births are bad at all. I know women who had great births in the hospital, but I think some women realize if they can just sort of, you know, talk themselves through it, that that the pain can be dealt with. It doesn't, even if you do have pain, it doesn't have to kill you. Hmm. And I know, you know, I had some pain in all my births. It just wasn't anything that I felt like, yes, I, I to me, the hospital, I just had a thing about doctors. I just I did not really look at them as a source of comfort for me. Not that I don't think there's a place for doctors, but for me in my own life, I had had some traumatic experiences, and I just didn't feel that um, it, it didn't give me any comfort to think about going to the hospital. And I did feel like you know, everything is going to be okay. Certainly, a woman should pay attention to her intuition, mm-hmm. but sometimes a woman is saying, you know what, I. I felt like something was wrong. I just felt like something was wrong. And then they go to the hospital and, well, maybe nothing was really wrong or, you know, but so I think you kind of get to know yourself and, and sort of learn, yes, you can have a valid intuition that something's wrong and you can also have a fear. And that fear can sometimes feel like, you know, it's the end of the world when it, it really isn't. It's just, yeah. you know, your body is doing what it needs to do. All right. And when you had your uh, babies, did you have? Uh, did you cut the cord yourself? Was that an easy thing to do? Um, did you, yeah. Did you leave the cord on for long, or did you just cut it straight away? Um, at that time, I think with our first baby, we may have cut it fairly soon. We didn't really know. I hadn't read anything about waiting. I don't think we were in any particular hurry. Yeah. You know, at that time, I don't think I consciously thought about waiting. But I don't think I was in any hurry either. So I think I always, um, other than with the first one, I waited for the placenta to come out. Sure. I, I'm pretty sure I did. We just didn't really make that big of an issue of it. But And then we we tied a, a, a string around it, a mm-hmm. uh, couple inches from the baby's belly button. Now, But with the last baby, we just cut it. We never tied it. So... Um, you know, either way, I mean, some people believe that if you tie it off, that it can trap bacteria in there. I don't know. I never had a problem with that. But for some reason, we just didn't tie it with the last one. And I don't even remember why, whether we, we didn't think she was going to be born that day. I was, I had kind of estimated my due date. I I thought I was, I never knew when I conceived because I was breastfeeding. And so I just didn't exactly know when I had gotten pregnant. Uh, which worked out well because sometimes if you know when you got pregnant, then you know, and here's my due date, and then people start calling you, and did you have the baby yet? You know, I know. So, um, but I guess we must have not had a string ready or something, and so we we just cut it. We didn't tie it. Okay. And then I since then that some there are some midwives that believe that that's actually preferable. But um, you know, an animal in the wild just chews through the cord. You know, it yeah. is but easy enough to cut it with the scissors. There are some people that believe in never cutting the cord. Um, it's called lotus birth. Yeah. There are people in the unassisted birth world or home birth world or even giving birth in hospitals that believe that you should never cut the cord. I never have felt drawn to lotus birth. Uh, to me, it's, it's it would be too much trouble to keep the placenta wrapped up and keep it with the baby and keep putting herbs on it and keep putting, you know, in towels. And I... For me, it's like the placenta has done its job, honor it and let it go, and then focus on the baby. I've seen too many people get hung up on, 
you know, that that placenta becomes an entity in and of itself, and they spend a lot of time trying to preserve it. And I, I don't think it's cruel to cut the cord. I think once the placenta has done its job, just like, you know, the majority of animals will just chew through it. So that was personally how I felt. I didn't choose to give birth that way, but I do think it's good to, to at least wait until it stops pulsating mm-hmm. to cut it. Yeah, we, we actually know a couple that uh, just had a, uh, recently had a lotus birth, and uh, they, they documented it all, so that, that was fairly interesting to, to see for sure. So it's something that we actually have been looking into as well. Yeah, um, just uh, wondering, Laura, your, um, your opinion on water births? Uh, I think the water can be wonderful. My, uh, my daughter uh, gave birth in water. Uh, I have a little grandson who's uh, almost a year and a half old, and it's actually the only birth other than my own that I've ever been to. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of, uh, that was really an experience because it's like I've been writing about birth for, you know, 25 years, 30 years, and I've never been to a birth. So uh, so she gave birth in water. She had a an amazingly non-interventive midwife who uh, was off to the side unfortunately after the baby was born that's when they came in with their interventions and like oh we better get you out of the bath right now we better give you a shot of pitocin you know but but the birth itself was really beautiful and and the, she found the water really helpful uh, and I think a lot of women really enjoy giving birth in, wa- in water if it can relax you fine that's great I've always been drawn to water when I've been in labor you know take a bath or take a shower during labor I've never felt drawn to give birth in water my one objection to water birth is that I think there are some people that make it the the be all end all that if everybody should would just everyone should give birth in water because water is the thing it's just like you know everybody should give birth with a doula or everybody should give birth with a midwife and they tend to make it the thing that's going to make birth good and I think whatever helps you relax and trust your body and if you feel like you need somebody else there fine if you if you if water helps you relax fine if massage does it if you know having sex does it or or being affectionate or whatever whatever can get you into that zone then do it just don't make that you know I knew a couple that that was planning a water birth and a water main broke the day she went into labor and they had no water well you know I think if you if you decide that water is going to be the thing that's going to make this a good birth for you you know don't get attached to that thing outside of yourself that's yeah. going to make it. but it's a tool it's another tool yeah make, makes so much sense everything you're saying really does um, brilliant just, just just one last question um i forgot about that um i, I just find this fa- fascinating because of my uh, um own belief in the, the power of the mind um you know, your, your your husband at the time you, you said that he was able to lactate um <laughs> yeah that, amazing well that was just like a little experiment that uh you know now people who think i'm strange you know <laughs> with my ideas about birth think i'm even stranger but but to me it just shows the power of the mind that we had read um after our first was born we had read in a breastfeeding book that men were biologically capable of producing milk and that there are men who out, throughout history who have produced milk and that sometimes say if a woman you know would die in childbirth or something and and that there are men who would t- put the baby to their breast and produce milk mm-hmm. and I had read one man did it through prayer and um, you know certainly basically anybody will produce milk if their nipples are stimulated in David's case he didn't do anything physical he just thought oh well this is interesting I wonder what would happen if I said to myself that I believe I'm producing milk and so he said that to himself you know for a week or so Mm -hmm. and uh, one day he was reading he was sitting there reading a book and he felt this wetness on his t-shirt and he lifted up his shirt and he saw that one breast was slightly um, engorged and milk was dripping out. So, and we showed my father, who was a physician, and he said, well, obviously there's something physiologically wrong with David. But, you know, David, he never actually nursed our babies, but he just told himself, okay, I believe, you know, it'll go away, and it went away. Wow. So, um, so I just think it shows you know how I mean men do have mammary glands and I think it's sort of nature's backup system you know I've heard of tribes where the men nurse the babies so I think now we have formula if a woman really can't nurse but I think nature does provide that you know a man can produce breast milk and uh, 
Now, I think you have to watch out that if you do nurse your babies and you, some men I write to me and they say, well, I used a breast pump and I, you know, I, I have a story on my website in my article, um, Milkmen, Fathers Who Breastfeed, about a, a gay couple that, that adopted a baby and during the pregnancy of their, the woman that they was carrying the baby, the man used a breast pump and got his milk flowing and by the time the baby was born, he had a really pretty good supply. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it, it is, it happens. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, I suppose, testimony of the, the, the power of the, the mind um, and the, 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 the power that we have w within our bodies. And, uh, you know, if, if, a, if a man was able to produce milk, then um, I'm sure a, a woman is able to have a, an unassisted birth, you know. <laughs> Right. I think we just can't underestimate the power of our own thoughts and feelings. You know, we have this tremendous power within us and we just need to not be afraid of it, embrace it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so just, just finishing up, yeah, you've, you've given us so much for your time, so I really appreciate that. First of all, thank you. Um, sure. Uh, and we're going to we're going to put your we're going to have your links to your website and books etc. Uh, below this video. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, finish off with to share? Um, well, I do some birth consulting that uh, I help women. Um, you know, some women who feel like they need a little bit of help with overcoming their fears. So I have information about that on my site, and I enjoy doing that. I sometimes I get to, I talk to couples on the phone. And, uh, and saying the same sorts of things that I've said here, just, um, you know, ultimately, I, I don't really believe that people need me. <laughs> I think they just need themselves. Yeah. But, um, but I, I'm there to help. I don't give medical advice, but I can help women with, uh, or men with helping face their fears and give them some suggestions, tell them what worked for me. Um, I think... Uh, other than that, uh, I think there's, I really encourage women to read, and men also, to read birth stories. I've got a ton of great stories on my site, mm -hmm. so I found that very helpful. And watch birth videos. There's some great birth videos. I have one on the main page of my site that uh, is a friend of mine, Cleo, giving birth, just very peacefully. And I think that can really help if you just, when I was writing about this years ago and I was talking about my birth, some people would say, yeah, I don't think that's really true, you know, what you're saying that you gave birth that easily. Well, I didn't have any documentation. I never tried to film any of my other births after the first one. Now there is a lot of documentation. You can look and you can see. Yeah. And, it, and it really helps. Amazing. That, yeah. Yeah. And connect with like-minded people. That join forums and go to websites and join um, email lists and connect with people that are giving birth the way that you want to. Yeah. Because that can really be helpful to have a community. Okay. Well, awesome. Awesome stuff. And uh, thank thank you very much, Laura. It's, it's been uh, it's, it's been great to connect with you and uh, uh, hear everything you've had to say. It's, you know, it's such a it's yeah, such well, good luck. birth. Thank you. Thank you. It's such amazing knowledge and uh, like underneath it all, or within everything you've said there's a there's a very powerful message there and I, I think the message is that we have the power within us you know and it's just b believing in our own uh, abilities I, I think as well you know it's it's a lot easier than people make it out to be it's just just relax and trust yourself babies yeah. come out awesome thank you